uh, Macbeth is the play. Uh, and you will know, perhaps from, from your own experience or from reading my chapter on Macbeth, that Macbeth is a play which is often thought of as very unlucky in the theater, that there are superstitions attaching to it, that uh, there often have been injuries of people walking off the stage. The one I, instance I'm sure I, I, I cite is that of an actress who thought that the sleepwalking scene would be more effective if she actually had her eyes closed, walked right off the edge of the stage and into the pit. But the, things have fallen down. People have been stabbed then fires. All kinds of things have happened. Uh, this is it's a superstitious play for actors. One doesn't mention the name of the uh, main male or female characters when on the stage. I was once taking a tour of, I think it was the uh, Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford, Ontario, in Canada, uh, and when I was performing up there, and one of the actors showing people around the theatre was on the stage and happened to mention the name of the play, and he looked absolutely ashen and performed one of the purifying rituals that is involved with this, involves turning around three times and quoting something from, from The Merchant of Venice and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a play that has become uh, a, a, uh, an icon of, of superstition within the, uh, the acting world. There are wonderful murder mysteries actually on this topic as well, uh, one by the, the terrific British mystery writer uh, Niall Marsh. The, uh, so why is this? Um, it's hard to say why. The, the superstition begets superstition, but it's, it's reasonable to uh, talk about the degree to which the play doesn't remain within its own boundaries, that it begins with the Weird Sisters, uh, sometimes known as the witches, that it involves various kinds of supernatural or superstitious happenings, a ghost appears and disappears and so forth, uh, and that the play itself is, to a certain extent, uh, engaged with this question of boundaries and of whether you are ever in a safe place with respect to them, whether the on stage and the off stage or the on page and the off page can e really be as readily delimited as that. Uh, the, almost any production takes this into consideration, especially because the scenes with the witches or the weird sisters seem to surround the play as it is performed. Anyone ever seen the Roman Polanski film of Macbeth? Um, can you, uh, and anybody uh, who's raised her or his hand, uh, explain to our friends in the room what the historical occasion is that begat this film? Do you know what it was based on? Yes. Can you say? It's based on the murder of Sharon Tate. The Tate LaBianca murders happened just before Roman Polanski filmed this. And, and who was Sharon Tate to him? His wife. His wife. His wife. England at the time of the murder. He was not at home. And how much of this do you want? <laughs> <laughs> the people who had been renting the house before the um, Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate moved in were Terry Melcher and Candace Bergen. Terry Melcher was Doris Day's son, as you may know. And it may have been aimed, the murder may have been aimed at them or something they had done. They had moved out just shortly before the house was taken over by Polanski and his wife. Okay, and just just to maybe to say something about who the ostensible, uh, who, who the miscreants were in this regard, because we haven't said anything about who actually committed these murders. So, so here, Mel, if you please. Yes, no, right, right behind you, behind you, yes. The, Do you remember? I'm, I'm blocking on the name. Charles Manson, yes, so, it's, so it's, this, is, this is Charles Manson and his uh, women, uh, uh, squeaky from and and right. So so th so th this is this is a production of the play uh, that is mounted by Polanski, certainly in response to their intertextual moments with respect to the, the scene in particular of the the murder of Macduff's wife and children is very bloody and the whole thing is very psychedelic. It picks up on the entire thematic of the uh, Manson family and uh, the, the, since family is a big issue in this play thematically as well. But the what I, reason I'm, I'm mentioning it here is because if, it, if, if you've seen the film, you may remember that it does not end as the uh, play does here with Malcolm's uh, encouraging words about how things will now become earls and how England will now become Scotland and so forth and all will be healed. 
but it ends instead with another scene having to do with the witches in which the second son, Donald Bane, the, 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 the uh, second son of Duncan, uh, is seen arriving at the witch's hovel and knocking on the door. And it seems clear that he is about to ask the same kind of question that happened at the beginning of the play, uh, what about me? Uh, what's, what lies in store for me? So that instead of coming to a conclusion which resolves and purifies the world, uh, the Polanski version, which is a dark version of the play, if one can imagine a non-dark version of the play, but uh, uh, ends with repetition, ends with an explicit gesture of repetition in which, again, the rivalry between the two men, but the, in this case between the two sons, uh, turns itself into the possibility of another civil war and another, another repetition of the same. So um, the, the play has had many lives and continues to have many lives. And this, this all-female production is interesting in the way that it, it, it reverses the, what were presumably the, uh, sorry, the, the conditions of the original production in which all the parts were played by men. So what does it mean if it means anything for all the parts to be played by women? Uh, tell me what you, uh, how many ways as you encountered this play, uh, a play that I'm sure many of you have seen or heard about before, how many ways you, f you interpreted the witches or the weird sisters? Uh, how do you understand their role in the play? They seem to be associated at least with fate, with an, almost a kind of destiny uh, embedded in Macbeth's personality uh, in, in that uh, he's heroic at the beginning because he's a relentless warrior in the cause of, of the king, but he is also relentless in his, in his ambition, uh, finally, when he commits, relentless in his ambition to uh, get and hold the throne. So you've said two things that I might have thought would be in tension with one another. One, that they seem connected with fate, and the other, that they seem connected to Macbeth's personality or character. How can those, both of those things be the case? Um, in the sense that we're fated by our personalities. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. So this is the classical notion that character for mankind is fate, uh, ethos anthropo daimon, the old notion from, from, from Sophocles, really, of how it is, and, and from, from uh, Euripides, of how it is that people create the fates that then seem to be the things that condition their lives. Uh, this question of whether the witches, let's call them that, are inside or outside Macbeth, uh, or as you'll see in this production, anybody seen the production yet? The, 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 remember how the, how the production begins? What, what's happening on the stage at the very first moment? The, the witches are riding around um, and what, what, what else, who else is on stage beside the witches? Do you remember? No, I don't. The, the Lady Macbeth is, is napping at the, or is in bed, is seen on, lying on pillows and having a nightmare at the beginning of this production. So it's interesting that in this production, which is about women in power, the witches seem somehow to be a part of the imaginative world of Lady Macbeth, maybe instead of, or in addition to the imaginative world of Macbeth. But certainly in the playtext as we have it, there seems to be some uncanny, this is the word, some uncanny relationship between what Macbeth wants, desires, dreams of, uh, expects, fears, and what the witches say to him. So they are either mirroring what he is thinking or anticipating what he is thinking, or else the other way to look at it would be that his own character is being formed in response to them. There are three of them. What are they like? Please. Please, please, please. Yes. Physically, they have beards, they have chapped be hands. They have beards. Uh, is that... Women, but they the conflict between being male and female. Right, and who, who is it in the play who notices that? What character in the play points that out to us? Banquo. Banquo, Banquo. Banquo. Remember what he says, you should be women, but your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. 
and this whole question of whether you're forbidden to interpret things or whether interpretation is, this is one of the reasons the play is so uncanny and why this whole ethos about accident and unluckiness seems to me to be so powerful is because it's a play about interpretation and about forbidden interpretation and about the relationship between interpretation and, uh, between interpretation and dream or wish or desire. Uh, but, but here, uh, you should be women. That is, I would expect you to be women, but your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. So they're bearded, uh, bearded women. What else? Yes, right behind. I have to give Larry some exercise, so I have to have some people over on this side asking questions, too. They're also petty. At one point, we see one witch who, because somebody wouldn't give her chestnuts, decides to curse the woman's husband at sea. And so right. they seem to not always be concerned with large supernatural events, but also... That's, that, they're, that's right. They're, 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 their concerns are local and small. You say petty, I think it's perfectly reasonable. Uh, but on the other hand, how might that story about the sailor and his wife and the chestnuts be related to the big play that we come to later on? Is there any analogy between that couple and the couple that we then come to encounter? You don't see an analogy between this Macbeth and the sailor or Lady Macbeth and the sailor's wife or... Um, Yes. This is not going to be the answer you want. I, okay. <laughs> when I read this passage, and the sailor was going to Aleppo, and I thought of Othello right away. Right, right. But not, not Macbeth. Well, uh, but uh, Aleppo is interesting because, again, it's one of those exotic locations outside of the European matrix. But what, as happened indeed in Venice and in Cyprus, turns out that it's in you know, safe Europe that all the wildness is actually happening, not so much in these, in these other exotic locations. All right, so the witches are uh, the petty, that is to say they're interested in local things. Let's talk for a second about witches in this time period. Uh, any reason that you can think of why King, why, why King James would be interested in a play about witches? Uh, what, what kind of a book did he write? Just uh, define, I don't know. He wrote, wrote a book called Demonology, or uh, exactly. Uh, and uh, what's it about, or what might a book like that be about? Cure. He could cure people. Ah, well, that's something else. That, that's that's the that's the the king's touch. The famous idea of the king's touch that the, the the king was able by his very hand to cure this question, which we see thematized in the play about whether the king is holy and cures or diseased and gives disease to the whole society. Uh, but James is interested in witches. He writes a book called Demonology. Uh, there's a the 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 time period is deeply engaged with this question of how, whether there are real witches or not, how you can tell them, how you can distinguish them from ordinary people, male or female, because not all witches are female. And in fact, in many productions, there's a male witch. These three women, three figures aren't always women. Um, the, uh, the, there's a big debate about whether the, the, uh, location of witches or witchcraft is in fact a, a, a political scam rather than an actual uh, uh, correct finger pointing at them. And there's also a difference which maybe would be useful for us to bear in mind between how witches were thought to behave within the boundaries of Britain and how they were thought to behave on the continent. That, that uh, continental witches were uh, imagined as more powerful, as more, more uh, actually being able to control life and death and to play tricks on people. The, the uh, local witches, the, you know, the old woman in the, in the village uh, in Britain, often thought of as more, more uh, to use the word that we used before, more petty, more local, more, 
more bad-tempered than actually having magical powers. But at this point, of course, Scotland is at least as much Europe as it is England. That we're, we're, it's the, 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 the question of sort of what is the power of these witches? And are they, are they actually women? Are they actually people? Or are they supernatural? And how do they know what they know? Do they actually uh, make anything happen? Or do they merely hold up things for Macbeth and uh, Banquo to interpret? And do they, in fact, over-interpret or over-recognize what is presented to them? Is, in other words, is this external agency changing uh, the, the political world? Or is it, and this is the split with which we began, or is it, in fact, the vaulting ambition of Macbeth or Lady Macbeth uh, that produces this effect, which is then wished off onto these witches. Yes. The fact that the fact that Banquo also sees the witch, the witches, yes. um, complicates the idea of of them being ex externalizing what's in Macbeth. Absolutely. Because it would have to be also externalizing what's also in Banquo. That's that's absolutely so. right. That's and is there anything in the play uh, that that is more clearly and purely phantasmatic rather than verifiable. Part, which you say, uh, or someone says, probably wasn't written by Shakespeare. Everybody says it wasn't yeah, written right. by Shakespeare. Okay. Yes, right, right. Uh -huh. um, and it, when you read it, you can see how different it is. Right. Um, but it, but, but there's, there's an episode within the play in which Macbeth sees something uh, that is much more a clear, pure fantasy. What is it? The dagger. It's the dagger. Is, it, is this a dagger I see before me, the handle toward my hand? And um, what happens to the dagger in the course of his looking at it, seeing it? Does it remain the same or does it change? It becomes bloody, yes. It, the, the, uh, on, its, on its hilt uh, and dagger and uh, gouts of blood, which were not, was not, he says, there before. Uh, so that it, it becomes bloody in the course of his imagination. Now, again, some productions... I'd indeed, including this production, uh, literalize it. A dagger somehow appears, or is, and, but but I, I, the 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 whole concept here, I think, is that he is seeing something in his mind's eye, and that then changes. So you're quite right that Banquo uh, is one of those verification figures that we often find in Shakespeare. Notice that that many Shakespearean heroes appear with sidekicks. Uh, who's Hamlet's sidekick? Horatio, uh, Othello, insofar as he has a sidekick, who would it be? Sorry? Well, Iago's is sort of anti-sidekick, but, but Cassio also, okay. Um, in King Lear, who is the figure who speaks to us, so to speak, in terms of verification, saying there's Kent, but there's also Edgar, uh, the, I, I would not take this from report, but it is, and my heart breaks it in, and so forth. That there's, there's, there's someone on the stage uh, who encounters things and verifies it. That the things that seem impossible or unbearable are nonetheless true. When uh, Horatio, at the end of Hamlet, is asked by Hamlet to to uh, uh, to stay alive and to tell my story. Uh, this, the, the idea is that, again, something is going to verify what has taken place. Something is going to attest to what has taken place. And at the beginning of the play, Banquo seems to be performing precisely this function, that, that it's the, the, one cannot merely say uh, these are witches of the mind in the way that one could say it's a dagger of the mind. They, if they are of the mind then the mind is bigger than the character of Macbeth. And this is also a possibility that the whole play is a kind of a dream or a nightmare. And this is one thing that I think is possible in the staging of this, this uh, actor Shakespeare project uh, with beginning as a dream, beginning with, with Lady Macbeth having this dream, that the whole thing could be imagined as the Midsummer Night's Dream might be imagined, as, as the Tempest might be imagined, as a kind of dream. Uh, but, but indeed, the, the, the witches, also we encounter them before we encounter him, don't we? So we, you know, they, maybe he's their dream. Uh, there's, there's a sense in which their priority uh, has some impression 
upon us. Uh, where would you say this, the, these weird, first of all, why are they called weird sisters? What does the word weird mean? Fate, yes, exactly. It's uh, this old English word, weird, uh, which becomes our word, weird. And that they are, what, what else are they called? Beside weird sisters, anything else? Yes. They are called withered hags, absolutely. Secret black and big night hags. Uh, what is it that you do? Anything else? Okay. Um, so they, they are they are potentially figures of fate, whatever that means. Uh, they may be related to the three fates. They may be related to the notion of the problem. You remember the notion of the three fates as those that that uh, sp uh, spin and weave and cut the story of a man's life. Uh, but they also may be somehow related to the characters within the play, the human characters within the play, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. So if Banquo is the, the partner on stage of Macbeth, uh, uh, what, what relationship do they have to one another? And what, why is his function important? Anybody? Yes. They are the two generals uh, for Duncan. Uh, in other words, they are sort of co-generals uh, protecting Duncan. Yeah. So they, they, they are, these, these are, as usual, as usual, we've seen this over and over again. Play begins after the battle. There's, there's you know, you think that the, just as a fellow going off over to Cyprus is going to fight the Turks, but in fact the war is over by the time he gets there. Here too, the play begins with a battle and then the battle is over and we have the two virtuous generals here, Macbeth and Banquo. Virtuous as contrasted with whom? Yes, and who is the Thane of Cawdor? Yeah. He, he was a traitor and turned against Duncan. And uh, why, why is that? Yeah, that's quite right. Why is that important to the play? Well, Macbeth. Then Duncan then gives his title, presumably his, his lands, to Macbeth, as it, the witches had promised. As the witches had promised. As the, so, so the, first, the witches hail him. All hail Macbeth. Uh, Thane of Gloms, Thane of Cawdor, who shall be king hereafter. And the Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes, he says. And famously, this is a, a, a play which has been associated by critics with clothing, with clothing that fits or doesn't fit and so forth. But this, this, this fantasy somehow uh, that this is a mistake. That, that, and then, of course, it, it turns out to be true. As you say, the thing that we know about this Thane of Cawdor is that he is a traitor. Uh, uh, how determinative is that of something that we might believe about Macbeth? Um, what happens when, the, when Duncan chooses Macbeth as the replacement for the Thane of Cawdor? Looks like, it's like what I said about the end of the play, looks like it's going to cure this problem. We used to have a traitor as the Thane of Cawdor, and now we're in fact going to have a virtuous good captain, and instead it actually performs the repetition again, one traitorous Thane of Cawdor for another traitorous Thane of Cawdor. Uh, what, what do, they, what do the, the weird sisters say to Banquo? Not the same, but he, he will you will get kings. You won't be king, but you will get kings, exactly. Uh, the Ban Banquo wants to thrust himself into this conversation. You know, the, 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 uh, he, he uh, speak then to me, if you can look into the seeds of time and tell which, which, which one will grow and which will not speak then to me, happier and Macbeth, than Macbeth and less happy. By happy, what does happy mean? And what's the word happy mean in this context? Fortunate, fortunate yes, it, it has that strong sense of, of, of lucky or fortunate. It's not merely ha 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 happy. It's not merely glad in the, in the short term, but it, it, has, it has some of that fate characteristic happenstance, good hap, good luck uh, connected to it, happier than Macbeth and less happy and so forth. And uh, immediately then, 
what begins to happen is a kind of split between these two who were good friends. This is, again, you see this not only in Shakespearean tragedy, but also in Shakespearean comedy, when pairs of sisters or pairs of cousins begin to split when something of, the, of, of mutual interest to them, in, this, in the case of a comedy, it might be a love interest, comes to split them. In this case, of course, it's not a love interest unless you think of the throne of Scotland as, as, a, as a, an object of desire here. Uh, Macbeth immediately begins to have second thoughts about Banquo, and those second thoughts will, of course, culminate in a, in a late and powerful scene. But uh, in the meantime, they are both friends, and they're both trying to figure out what's, what's happened here. And we should say something about the king, who is, is actually uh, receiving uh, the information about the traitorous Thane of Calder. Tell me something about King Duncan. Yes. He's just sort of naive. And what evidence do we have of his naivete? Well, that he just, um, you know, appoints Mac, uh, Macbeth as Thane of Cawdor, and he just goes on and waxes <laughs> enthusiastically about how things will grow, and he goes right out. He goes there very quickly. <laughs> do you remember what he says about the Thane of Cawdor and his disillusionment? with the Thane of Cawdor. But, um, yes, in the back there, please. He says he was a gentleman in whom he had absolute trust. Right. Yes. So. I, and just before that, he says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. So the, the, that, that seeing the surface is uh, that he's an interpreter of the surface. So this is to support your point about his optimism or his naivete. Uh, almost always, again, to speak structurally about these plays, we're going to find that there's something about the king or the ruler or the duke at the beginning of the play that is naive or under-examined, that, that, that needs to take a second look at things and that, that, that may allow for things to go wrong because he, it's usually he, uh, has, has failed to appreciate the possibility of, of difference or, of, uh, or the necessity for self-interrogation. And that's what we have with Duncan at the beginning of the play. Uh, so that what's, what's put in place here is the idea that a successful ruler of Scotland is going to have to cure this fault. That this is, I mean, he, this is a beloved king. Uh, it's precisely his trustingness that makes him so appealing in various ways. But it, what leads to uh, the capacity for treason, that he doesn't double read, that he doesn't look behind the face to find the mind's construction. And this theme, of course, is going to continue throughout the play. As Macbeth says, things like stars hide your fires, let not light night see my dark and deep desires, and uh, much, much conversation about wearing masks, wearing visors, concealing uh, your true look from people who might be looking at you. And a great deal of the play, in fact, does take place at night. Um, so that the, the, uh, the, the problems are set up at the beginning of the play. The play begins with, with multiple destabilizations. It begins with the weird sisters. It begins with the uncanniness of their knowing the names of Macbeth and Banquo and having these predictions. And it begins also with, with the news of treason. And also, the, 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 <coughs> excuse me, with a, a character who shows up very early on to deliver a message to King Duncan, who is also a very enigmatic character. Do you remember this character called the bloody captain or the bleeding captain? Uh, what, th this, this is the kind of character who shows up in these plays to deliver a speech. Uh, we looked at this a little bit uh, in King Lear when we, we had the, the anonymous gentleman toward the end of the play who testified to Cordelia's weeping. Her smiles and tears were like a better way, like sunshine and rain at once. Uh, uh, her, her tears like pearls from diamonds dropped and so forth. Uh, and that gentleman had really no other function performing in the play except to deliver this iconic speech. So also with the bleeding captain who comes to report what happened at the battle. Uh, and how does he do you remember? Let's look at this passage. Maybe it's a wonderful passage to, to, to look at to begin with. Um, it's Act 1, Scene 2, uh, about line seven or eight. Captain, doubt, doubtful it stood, 
as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonwald, worthy to be a rebel, for that to the multiplying vil villainies of nature do swarm upon him, from the western isles of Kearns and gla Gallo glasses is supplied. What are they? Kearns and... They're, they're, yes, they're mercenary soldiers. They're, 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 they're peasants who are armed and so forth. So these are, the, these are the names of kinds of troops, the types of people. And fortune on his damned quarrels smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak. For brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name, disdaining fortune, with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. Uh, the, uh, so let's, let's look at this speech more, more carefully here. Doubtful it stood. What's the it? The battle. The battle. Okay. What does doubtful mean? The, who, it could, the, 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 the outcome could go either way. So the doubtfulness is in the battle itself. Like two spent swimmers, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. Now, is this image predictive of anything that happens later on in the play? You were to, if, if I were to say to you, know, who were the two spent swimmers? That Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are, 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 have often been, been looked at in this way as figures who pull each other down, as exhausted swimmers. I mean, the, the spent meaning exhausted from swimming too far or too long, and seeking to rescue each other, in fact, lead to their collective downfall to spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. Now, what, what, what art, what's the art here? Sorry? Swimming, Swimming. yes, exactly. So it's, the, it's the, uh, the, the, the battle is like two swimmers uh, who are exhausted and who, seeking safety from one another, in fact, find the opposite. Uh, this, this image of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth uh, if it is one, but this image anyway of the two sw spent swimmers is one that does carry over to the rest of the play when we see the degree to which their uh, interanimation, their relationship with one another, which is initially conceived as mutually supportive, my dearest Chuck and so forth, uh, leads ultimately to their mutual downfall. Um, the, and how is, how, how is Macbeth described in this passage? By, again, we haven't met him yet. We get this leading captain, who, a man covered with blood. So, so the, one of the first human images that we see in the play is a man coming onto the stage covered with blood. And what is his account of Macbeth? Sorry? He's, yes. Yes, he, he's, 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 so Brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name. The name is Brave, not Macbeth here, although we'll, 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 we'll see that that name Macbeth does echo. Disdaining fortune. So first we've had the witches, now we have Macbeth disdaining fortune. With his brandished steel, uh, carved out his passage till he faced the slave. Who is the slave? MacDonald, exactly. So that we, we have the image of a face-to-face -face battle between these two figures. Uh, now, I should say that a quite well-known and good feminist critic, uh, Janet Edelman, read this passage about his carving out his passage bloodily uh, till he faced the slave MacDonald as a kind of birth fantasy, prefiguring the Macduff is not, is not a woman born phenomenon at the end of the play, giving birth to himself, so to speak, uh, carving out his own way here. Uh, the until uh, he faced the slave, and then he uh, uh, unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. Where's the nave? Where are the chops? So from the <laughs> right, right. Um, unseamed him uh, again. This is the uh, sorry. It's the other way. Right, right. From the nave to the chops. <laughs> Uh, and cut his head off, uh, and fixed his head upon our battlements, okay? So how is that predictive of hap something that happens later in the play? 
Ah, uh, behold, where 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 uh, sta where stands the the the. The traitor is a cursed head. I'm trying, getting the scansion slightly wrong. Um, uh, behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head? That's what it is, the usurper's cursed head. Uh, so that, so that all of these things, that, well, the reason I'm pointing this out to you is to show you what a beautifully crafted play this is. That all of these things that seem trivial and local at the beginning of the play, that seem either local in the, the case of the witch and the story about the sea captain and the chestnuts, or local in terms of the account of the specificity of how Macbeth comes to fight with, with MacDonald, uh, and how, uh, what, and what happens to that, uh, traitor's head that all of these things, in fact, will return later on in the play. That this opening scene is completely predictive, if we only knew it, uh, to what happens later on in the play. Of course, we don't. Yes? I'm just going to also point out that um, talking about, I'm sorry, the lines um, with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution. I mean, you're just yes. seeing that again and again in the play as he, you know. Uses knives or right, right. E execution here having its more benign sense of doing something, of executing an act, but also of executing, killing people. And here again, that 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 blade or that sword is going to reappear, unbloody and bloody. And the question of what is treason is going to be raised in a complicated way throughout the play. And of course, this was a historically topical issue as well for King James. Uh, for this question of uh, uh, plots against his life, the so-called gunpowder plot that I talk about a little bit in my chapter. Uh, and that will recur with this word equivocation, which uh, shows up in the Porter scene, uh, the scene uh, which leads to the discovery of the dead body of Duncan, in which the Porter, the one comic figure in this play, talks about equivocating. And equivocating is a technical term here used. It comes comes out of out of supposed Jesuit practice. Uh, that it, it, it's a term that means having a mental reservation or holding something back. It's like crossing your fingers behind your back when you say, you know, uh, yes, I will, but I'm crossing my fingers behind my back, which means I might not. I'm not. You shouldn't really hold me to this expectation. That the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Uh, which is what Macbeth will later say uh, when he has the sense that the, the 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 witch's prophecies, which he has taken straight again, he has found the mind's construction in the face, as he thought. He thought he could understand them perfectly well. Turns out that he didn't interpret properly, that the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth is going to be, again, highly thematic for the play. It is related then to the social or cultural surround of the play, this question of of the idea that the Jesuits thought of as some, some of the enemies of the Protestant state as plotting the overthrow of the Protestant King James are equivocating and that this is their, their professional practice. Because of course, one thing you had to equivocate about was whether you were Jesuit, whether you were Catholic, whether in fact you were not a practitioner of the state religion. Uh, but equivocate, equally vocal, having two voices, having vo doubtful it stood as two spent swimmers. The, the idea of equivalence and especially equal voices on both sides becomes thematized throughout the play. That it has a, a local point, if not of origin, then at least of attachment with this, this idea of equivocating. Uh, but that the idea that everything is equivocal, that everything is, it could go either way, as we've said, is central to how the play itself functions and is, yes, please. I have a, a couple of questions which are not quite related to what you're talking about. Uh -huh. but I, when you said that um, um, all of these things will return, in other words, yes. this, this fight that uh, uh, Macbeth has with MacDonald Wald, I was thinking as you were saying that, that it, could it be argued that, uh, ironically, Mac, Mac, uh, this also returns with Macbeth's uh, fighting or defeating himself? 
that is to say, McDonald's is the Thane of Cawdor, which Macbeth, whom Macbeth will become. And this, this battle, in a sense, is a prelude to the struggle that will take place within him. But now this, I'm not sure McDonald is, in fact, the Thane of Cawdor. No, Sinel is the, S-I-N-E-L, is the Thane of Cawdor. No, but, 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 but I, think, I think this point is nonetheless the case, that, that every time Macbeth seems to be fighting an external enemy, he is also staging a fight with himself, as we see in the famous soliloquy about the supernatural solicitings, cannot be ill, cannot be good, if ill. I mean, where this is a perfect embodiment of equivocation. Are they ill? Are they good? They're good for this reason. They're bad. They're, they're ill for this other reason and so forth. That, that, that he, uh, and when he says, it shakes so this single state of man, that the minute he says the word single, meaning unitary or whole, uh, we're plunged into a world of doubleness, of double, double toil and trouble, of he's here in double trust and so forth, that, that this split between or this split within is absolutely always repeated in the play. So even if it's not the Thane of Cordo, I think your point is well taken. Was we were talking about Duncan and how literal he is, how he can't see beneath the surface of yes. things. Um, and I'm, it seems to me also that Macbeth is fairly literal with the witches. That is to say, he sees them as a neutral source of information. Right. And of course, takes them literally, especially their, the business at the end of the play, which proves to be uh, you know, very paradoxical in what it finally means. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me it's ironic that Macbeth also cannot really see beneath the surface of things. Uh, it, yes, that's, I think that's right. That, that, that's, and, and, and who succeeds Macbeth in this play? Um, Malcolm. And we have that whole scene, that, that odd little act, act four scene, six scene, that so many critics have wanted to go away because they think it's, it, uh, it's, it's bathetic. It's the scene in which Malcolm pretends to be a womanizer and a glutton and a, 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 an avaricious man and, and, and poor clueless Macduff. Uh, bleed, bleed, poor country. Again, notice all the blood that's all over this play. Uh, it takes him at his word when he says, I am guilty of all these sins. I'm much worse than Mac Macbeth. Um, and it turns out to be a test. It turns out to be Mac uh, Malcolm's test of Macduff's faithfulness to the principles of the Scotland that they both imagine, uh, rather than his loyalty to a king or king to be, even if the king is a bad king. And then he, he says, I'm, I'm, you know, never known woman, and I've never did my first false swearing was this upon myself, and so forth. That, 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 that this is another staging of this say one thing, mean another. And this is supposedly the scene which shows that a king of Scotland or a king of anything in this, these times must be wilier, must in fact test out uh, in in a way that doesn't seem very successfully Machiavellian, but never mind, must test out the, uh, the, 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 the ethics of his or her adherence by, by not allowing them to, to read the surface. So this question of, but, but this question of reading the surface is, I, I mean, that's why I began with the question of the, of the unluckiness and the witches and so forth. What's the surface? It's hard to know what the surface of this play really is. It's hard to know how far away to get so that we say, aha, that's just the surface. Behind it is these, or are these other things. But, but yes, everything repeats in this play and everything is doubled. So uh, bo both repeats and is doubled, those are two different activities of duality because the, the, the doubledness involves both, both, both two and a half, so to speak. Everything's cut in half and everything is done double. And every time they say double, they, 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 they imply split. Uh, he's here in double trust, says, says Lady Macbeth. Uh, the he here is, is King Duncan, of course. And in what sense is he at the castle of Macbeth in double trust? Yes. Both as the king and as a guest. As a house guest, yes. These are both crucial things. Remember that we talked with, when we talked about Gloucester about the, the vital element of hospitality in this time period and the degree to which, and, and we'll see it in Lady Macbeth when, when she pretends to, just, to, to be shocked at the idea of the death of Duncan and what does she say as she faints away? 
what, in our house? I mean, this is the ultimate, ultimate, both misplaced emphasis, but also underscoring this business of hospitality, that this is the worst possible place. And, and, and so he's here in double trust. This is, of course, of course, Macbeth saying, we will prefer no, we will proceed no further in this business. Uh, he, he has reason to trust us doubly because he is my king and because I am his host. And uh, that doubleness will then prove the undoing, uh, that the, uh, to say it twice means to unsay it, as it turns out. Uh, and that, that often happens in the course of this play, especially with the witch's utterances. Uh, the, the, so that the, the doubleness here becomes a sign of the loss of that single-mindedness, that single state of, mind, of man. Uh, so that this, this question of reading the surface becomes, again, itself doubled. On the one hand, you want to have a surface that you can read cleanly. You want there to be single rather than double. On the other hand, the minute you realize that there's a story behind the story, you yourself fall into that condition of the fallen world in which there's an ideal, in which there's also a kind of a fall. Uh, yes? Just going back to one of the things you said at the beginning. Yes. Uh, on the witches. Is, is that can that be interpreted as also they were placing the temptation or or sort of arousing his ambition because the ambition just sort of leaps out of nowhere. I mean, suddenly um, Macbeth turns from one sort of personality and, and she even more. I mean, you know, I think the first time we see her, she's already in this conspiracy, um, and it it happens very quick. Um, suddenly, we're in it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's hard to know when when. When he says two truths are told as uh, uh, as swelling uh, swelling prologues to this my imperial theme and so forth, the 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 the, um, the idea that the 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 evidence that that Thane of Glamis, Thane, Thane of Cawdor, uh, that shall be king hereafter. The, the, because he's got these two pieces of affirmative evidence must lead to, it's hard to know, and this is where we began by talking about it, hard to know whether the witches are echoing or, or the place of projection of his own thoughts or whether we are to imagine him as recognizing in them uh, some, something that comes from the outside and that, that gives him hope that this might be the case. But certainly his vaulting ambition uh, he's, he is disposed to read it in this way. He almost immediately takes these pieces of evidence to add up to something that we might say is what he had in mind all along, or that somebody had in mind all along. Yes, please. Yeah, I was wondering if, in addition to the, the bloodbaths, um, if the notion of repetition is what makes it so tragic that people don't learn from others' mistakes, right. or their own. Well, the, yes, it, it make, it, especially because once there is a repetition, how do you get out of the cycle of repetition? If the, every Thane of Cawdor is going to be a traitor, then uh, the, how do you get out of that cycle? And, and the, so, so precisely, it's the, these repetitions and also the misreadings. It's the repetitions plus the misreadings because it... it, it, it uh, Macbeth gets to the point where he thinks he can control knowledge or can control understanding. He has this moment of tremendous relief when they, in the, the cauldron scene when they, they produce these apparitions. And again, they never say, here's the QED of these apparitions. If you, you want to think about a, a formula like, a, like the, the, um, uh, the, the Renaissance emblems, this is something that appears in an emblem book in which you have three, this is a printed thing, in which you have three elements. You have a picture, a picture of a tree here. You have a motto, and you have a poem. And the three pieces together sort of make an emblem, make a sort of uh, the three things together uh, give you a visual, a, an aphoristic, and a verse form of the same kind of message, whether it's festina lente, you know, that make haste slowly with a picture of a, a, a turtle with a sail on him. This would be one, one famous one. Uh, so here, too, the, you've got the verbal, you've got the visual, and you've got the interpretation. And he, they allow him to interpret by not saying you have gotten it wrong. Or, and so he, the, 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 the irony is that the, the audience either is or is not doubly interpreting these, these emblems that we see uh, uh, presented to him. 
but he feels completely secure. He's got all knowledge that, you know, there's no such thing as a man of woman born. There's no such thing as a moving grove. The, so that the, 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 the emblems seem, or the, the apparitions seem to prove to him uh, that what he wants is that he's safe and that he, he, he is unassailable. Uh, and then it turns out, once again, that his interpretation hasn't gone beyond the surface. Uh, we're going to take a break now, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll deal with some questions of yours, but let's also maybe focus for a little bit on the question of gender in this play. So I thought we might start by looking at the letter reading scene, Act 1, Scene 5. Uh, the first scene in which we actually see Lady Macbeth, and that we might go from this scene to a discussion of Lady Macbeth's role and of gender as you see it being performed, if it is performed in the play. Um, Larry, would you do me a favor and read Lady Macbeth? Cross casting. Today. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed. Where, where shall I begin? Just from the if you do, scene? if you read the letter and just go to the end of her uh, speech uh, before I enter a messenger. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfect no report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail, king that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness has promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Clam as thou art, and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend that, sh uh, that without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst, wouldst wrongly win. Thou wouldst have great glams, that which cries thou must, this, thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishes should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. Thank you. I'll be the messenger and enter at this point. Yes, good. Okay, so this is the first time we see her. Um, the Actually, the director of the production uh, that's downtown pointed out to me that this is uh, one of the, the, Lady Macbeth is one of the first few characters that we encounter in Shakespeare who is alone when we first meet her. Um, one of the few female characters who is alone when we first meet her. And she is encountered already in a position of ventriloquism, please notice that the first lines that she speaks are not hers at all, but his. Uh, she is reading a letter from him. And it may take a moment, unless she waves the paper in front of you, for you to realize that she is again throwing her voice, so to speak, that she is reading this letter. Now, he, uh, functionally, the playwright has got to get this information to uh, Lady Macbeth in some way or another, but this is quite a long letter. Uh, and is not paraphrased. She doesn't say, I got a letter from you, and here's what it said. Uh, how, how might you interpret or understand or explain the fact that there is this long letter and uh, that it's read aloud by her? Yeah. It, it seems to me it tells us more about Macbeth and his state of mind, and also uh, gives us some information about uh, what, how he sees his relationship with Lady Macbeth. Uh, when he says, uh, learned by perfect, perfectest report, it seems like he's done some research. Uh, not much time has passed, and so obviously this is preoccupying him. But he calls her my dearest partner of greatness, 
And then he says, greatness has promised thee. Uh, by being ignorant of what greatness has promised thee. Earlier, he asked Banquo, what, what do you think about this thing about, you know, your, your sons are supposed to be kings? And it's almost like he's, he's leading her the same way. You know, this is not just about you, me, it's about you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it, yeah, so that's very interesting that the greatness is going to be a shared greatness, that she's going to become queen if he's going to become king. Absolutely. And my dearest partner of greatness also here, so that uh, before we hear anything from her, we hear something about the partnership, something about the relationship, the importance that he saw. It's not that he's going to arrive and then tell her this. He wanted the letter to get there beforehand so as to tell her. Of course, it gives us another go-round of this event. It gives us the scene again that we have just seen. But it also tells us something, or seems to suggest something, uh, in her voice describing or reading aloud his letter to him, uh, to her, of how he feels about her, and also allows her to have a dialogue with the letter, because she reads the letter, and then uh, she begins to comment upon it almost immediately. Uh, what is this? What does this do to the equality of their relationship? Yes. Even if in, in the beginning she appears alone on the stage, they are equally involved in this relation. Uh, his letter uh, makes her sure that she is involved and they are both in, in it. So that's why I said that they are equally involved. Well, d does she trust him to go through with this activity? Yes, and she even uh, encouraged him to go for, to go. When she says, on. yet do I fear thy nature, what does she fear? That thou art too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Why milk? Baby, yeah. yeah the, the, this, this idea of, uh, of him as, as a child, as, as being like the baby of a girl or baby girl, of... Uh, the, of her being not only his partner, but also his mother of that, 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 you know, famous moment in which she says, I've given suck and, and, uh, I, if the baby were still at my breast, I would dash its brains out if I had sworn as you have done to this, this all, this whole thematic about nourishing nurture, nourishing milk and the idea of Macbeth as the, the fed child. Uh, this, again, is in this little phrase, the milk of human kindness, that has become such a cliche for us, uh, produces. And what does kindness mean here? It doesn't mean, again, when we say the milk of human kindness, we mean something like how people are kind to one another. But in fact, what does human kindness mean in this context? Yeah, it means humanness, right, uh, humankind, human kindness, human, human uh, as opposed to what, then? What's, what, what we have other than human functioning here? We have the weird sisters, yes, indeed. Um, the Yet do I fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. What does nearest way mean? The easiest, yes, to, to go the most direct route. Now, again, one thing this play suggests is that, in fact, you don't go the direct route, that, that you've got to go out of your way to catch the witches again, then you've got to interpret and you've got to reinterpret and so forth, that this idea of catching the nearest way uh, is, is not going to, whereas turned out even with Duncan, because he mistrust, he trusted somebody he shouldn't have trusted, uh, as will turn out with Malcolm in his scene with Macduff, where the nearest way would be to say, yes, I'm a good king, believe in me, but the not the nearest way is to pretend to be a wicked king and or a wicked prince and so forth. That thou, thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition. Now, how is that different from being with ambition? Is this just because he's speaking, she's speaking Elizabethan English and you've got to have enough syllables in the line? Art not without ambition? Yeah. The double negative is weaker. 
So by saying that he's not without ambition, she's saying, yeah, you have some, but not maybe as much as I'd like. Right. And, but, and also, I mean, I completely agree with you. Also, listen to your phrase, double negative, that we, we're in that doubleness again, and double negative doesn't always make a positive in the arithmetic of this play. But to be not without something is highly characteristic of the world that we're in here. That's a way of being something, is to be not without ambition, uh, but without the illness should attend it. Uh, the, the footnote in my Arden here says, evilness, wickedness, the word was not used for sickness in Shakespeare's day. Uh, this is one of these things where uh, one would like to believe one's footnote, but in fact, um, what does the word illness mean in the course of this play? Yeah, I mean, canst not, thou not minister to a mind diseased, uh, he says to her doctor, uh, and the doctor replies there to the, the patient must minister to himself. The idea of the sickness of the state functions here as well. Uh, but but if, we, if we take our footnote uh, at face value, uh, without the uh, evilness should attend it, what thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou Holily, uh, what is highly and holy? What 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 is? Will somebody paraphrase that for us here? That what's uh, that? Hmm, sorry, what thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily? What does it mean? The thing you want the most, you can hope you can gain by the by the right way. Yeah, that that that, that, that you you deeply you deeply you you highly desire it. But you're hoping to get it without any sin or cost or, you know, loss of your own image of yourself as a good person or something like that. Uh, wouldst not play false and yet wouldst wrongly win. So already, uh, let me say that this Lady Macbeth sounds not completely unlike some other characters coded female that we've encountered in the play, that we have the double negatives, that we have here again, not, not, what's not play false, yet what's wrongly will. Uh, when uh, the, 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 there, there's a way in which the connection between Lady Macbeth and those weird sisters is already being rhetorically developed uh, when we first encounter her in her own voice. Uh, thou have great gloms, that which cries, thus thou must do. Now, again, this is a play in which things, inanimate things, cry out all the time and cry out injunctions that have to be both listened to and also interpreted. Uh, and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wishes should be undone. Uh, what's difficult about this passage and what's difficult about many passages in the first part of the play is the way in which they palter with us in a double sense. They function with all these double negatives. They, they are, uh, this is actually a fairly straightforward thing that she's saying. Uh, you don't have the courage to go out and get what you want. You're hoping it's going to come to you indirectly. You don't want to be regarded as evil or as scheming or as ambitious, but the whole passage is cut through with all of these negatives. Hi thee hither, come here, hi thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear. Why ear? Yes. It's the, it would be a way of poisoning some, somebody that you would put poison in their ear. Well, we certainly we have that um, from Hamlet, the idea of poison in the ear. It's, a, it, it's, it's at least, it could be a poisoning, absolutely. It could be a whispering or whatever it is. But it's, again, a kind of ventrilo. She's going to infuse him. Uh, there's a sense in which, again, I mean, one thinks in, in very abstract gendered terms, she is penetrating him rather than he penetrating her. That He is the vulnerable, open figure. She is going to, to intrude upon him and to pour her spirits into him and chastise with the valor of my tongue 
all it impedes thee from the golden round. Now, what's the golden round here, of course, is the, is the crown again. And that, that, that theme will also reappear. Uh, the, uh, so that, that before the rest of the world comes to encounter Lady Macbeth in the person of the messenger and then the arrival of Macbeth and of Duncan and so forth, we have already this double voicedness staged for us because of the ju juxtaposition of the letter and her own response to the letter and because of the doubleness that is involved in her own response. That, that, that the, all of these, these sentences that are balanced, the one on the that which thou highly, that which thou holily, and so forth, uh, she's already working within this rhetoric of doubleness uh, even before Duncan comes to the castle. Uh, what do you think about the relationship between Lady Macbeth and the witches? Is it far too simple to say they're versions of her, she's versions of them? How do you see them related, if at all? Does she have a beard, for example? She unsexes herself, right. And, and how and why? Um, I'm not sure, but... Why, why, why would that be something she might desire to do? Um, it's a man's world, and if she wants power, then she would have to play that game. Yeah, it's, it's because to be female is somehow to be weak, or it's a deficit, or it's, it's something like that. So to unsex here is also in a way to resex. I mean, we could say that she is in this medial space that they're in where, where beards butt women, uh, so that she's no sex, or she's both sexes, or something like that. Yes? Couldn't you say also that the witches are a part of Macbeth as well? I mean, they both reflect a fusion of the two of them. Well, we certainly, we certainly can say that, but, but we've actually in a way already said that by talking about his encounter with them on the heath. So now I want to do something else. I want to look at, at the way in which the witches are or are not a kind of avatar of Lady Macbeth so that we can come back to talking about the relationship between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. But, but so just for right now, I want to see if there are elements of commonality or distinction between the witches and Lady Macbeth. In a way, their predictions cause him to uh, consider actions that he might not have considered uh, previously, just like Lady Macbeth's urgings cause him to, he at this stage of the play is, uh, acts very equivocally, uh, and yet uh, he has both those influences, both from the witches and from Lady Macbeth. Could we say that they have already poured their spirits into his ear uh, since we, it began with his, they're hailing him, and uh, uh, with, with the message that they delivered to him, they are themselves spirits, of the earth or of the air, they, they, uh, so there's a sense in which this is again happening a second time. That it happens in the world of the supernatural, in which the, the witches have, at least in the text, this monstrous look of both or neither. Uh, you should be women, but your beards forbid me to interpret that you have so. And then you move, so it's a little bit like Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, who in the, in the internal world of the play has an ass's head because he has behaved like an ass. But there are other characters in that play who behave perfectly well like asses, who don't look like asses because they're not in that magical space of transformation. And the existence of a character who is sort of half ass, half man, uh, allows you to see that all men in love behave a little bit like asses, for example. So here, too, we have a, a, a world uh, which is not the ordinary world. It's the world of the heath. It's the world of the witches. It's the world of the night. It's the world of imagination, whatever it is, in which these figures have these monstrous guises. But it turns out that these monstrous guises are, if I say just, you won't misunderstand me, that they are allegories of a kind of monstrosity that functions in the ordinary world without our being able to see it or, or encounter it. That the, the, the physical, visible monstrosity of these witches allows you to say, aha, witch. 
Uh, with Lady Macbeth, you don't have any of that physical apparatus. In fact, in the production across the way, she uh, looks like a kind of Victorian lady. She wears a mob cap and she has a long dress and so forth. She doesn't seem at all really witch-like. Uh, but the question is, is she performing a similar function in his relationship to her and her relationship to him? To what extent is the the, the dream world of the Heath, uh, the, this wild world, this, this world which is like the, the green world or the inner world or whatever of a comedy, uh, to what extent is that the counterpart, the performative counterpart of what seems to be the quiet domestic world of the Macbeths? Because we haven't even gotten to the murder yet. We haven't even gotten to the point where Duncan enters the, upon the battlements and where the deed is done. Yes. Um, one of the things I think is interesting, though, is that um, in Macbeth's kind of first soliloquy after he sees the witches and he, he finds out he gets to be Thane of Court, or he says when he goes, you know, the supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good, the equivocation. And he said, well, if it's good, why am I yielding to this suggestion, the, the horror right. of which is on fixing my hair? So he's already had the idea of the nearest way yes. before he writes to her. Right. You know, because in a way, one is so taken often with Lady Macbeth's power. And, and you know, the witch is putting this in, she putting this in, but he's the one who's come up with this idea before he's even written a letter to her. That's absolutely the case. And yet he will go back on it once he's with her, uh, partly because, as you're suggesting, when he's alone, he can have both of these thoughts. When he's with her, she's got half the lines. And so he's, she, he's the good cop, she's the bad cop. Uh, she can say, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, when you durst do it, then you were a man. And this whole question about what a man is. A man is somebody who dares to kill the king. Uh, now, I, when, when the, the ghost of Banquo disappears, now it disappears, I am a man again. So manliness or, or maleness seems to be connected to this notion of unproblematic action or a, 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 non, uh, a, a non confrontation with one's inner dividedness. There's, there's something about, about, uh, and, and when he says to her, you know, uh, uh, bring forth men children only for the, thy undaunted metal should bring forth nothing but males. The idea here is that, 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 uh, that women produce, uh, femaleness produces this kind of inwardness or this kind of equivocation and that, that a, a race of pure males here uh, would be uh, the single state of man, again, rather than the doubleness, rather than the dividedness. Yes. I'm just. I'm wondering if you think that the play, if the play sets us up by the the what you've already talked about, the parallelism between Banquo and Macbeth getting this, the prophecies. Right. Does the play set us up to wonder if Banquo wouldn't have done the same thing had he had a Lady Macbeth of his own? Oh well, that's interesting because of course he doesn't. There's no Lady Banquo. Uh, what is there instead? What has he got that Macbeth doesn't have? He's a son. He's a son. And that distinction, I mean, when, when, when Macduff is looking for, for revenge and uh, he says he has no children, that the, it can't be simple an eye for an eye because he can't kill his children because he doesn't have any children. That the, this is this idea that Banquo has a son uh, is, is my fears in Banquo stick be, deep and so forth. This is the thing that, that, that Macbeth can't bear because when he starts thinking about it, he thinks, well, I'm going to do the deed, and Banquo is going to get the reward. He, his sons will be king. Uh, Banquo, you may know, was, was supposedly an ancestor of James I. So that the, one of the things the play does, especially in that perspective glass scene in which they, 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 the row of kings stretching out to the edge of doom in the, in the cauldron scene with the witches, predicts the, the rule of James and James's heirs into the future. It's thought that perhaps the last picture is a picture of James, or that, in, in my imagination, it's kind of mirror coming out to the audience, facing King James, who's sitting in the audience and showing him himself. But, the, but, but so the, 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 a, a play in which Banquo is the good guy his son escapes and is, in fact, the, the, predicts the future, which is the present, that is the present that is being performed here, uh, allows for this. this but, but precisely, Banquo lives in an all-male world. There's Banquo and there's Flans. There's no woman. 
there's no trouble. Uh, Macbeth is very dependent upon Lady Macbeth, as we tell, can tell from the letter immediately. Uh, and she uses it as a kind of script. She uses it as a script from which she is going to develop this entire plot. And uh, the, the, what is her role actually in the murder? Yeah, anybody? She takes the, the knife uh, the knives of the of the uh, men who were supposed to be guarding King Duncan who have been drugged and uh, puts them on their person and covers them with Duncan's blood. In firm of purpose, give me the daggers. Yes, yeah. indeed. The, the, the scene in which the, the, the deed is done but is not completely done because uh, the no one has been blamed for it. Uh, she goes back into the scene of horrors. She takes the daggers from him. It's the you know classic unmanning gesture. Uh, he's infirm. She takes the sword, the dagger, uh, and takes in that moment the control, the, the, the male control uh, over this. And then she, then she retreats wonderfully into her femininity, into her fainting spell, into because just as he's beginning to kind of natter on about, about things in a way that seems to her uncontrolled, she draws attention away from him. And this question about wh whether her, her faint is a real faint or a false faint is something that, that, that uh, scholars have debated. To you, what, what is it? Is she faking? <laughs> well, she's not the fainting kind up to this point. Uh, when we get to the sleepwalking scene, we'll find that, you know, the sleep and waking, which are an issue for all, both of these characters, uh, become topsy-turvy for her as well. But before we get to the sleepwalking scene, which I, I do want to get to, let's talk a little bit about the scene of the murder itself and about what happens as a result of it. The, uh, because it's, this is where the porter scene comes in as well. It's, 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 it's night. Uh, the, uh, the, the murder takes place, and we see the kind of dissociated conversation between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Did you cry? When? Now? as I descended, and so forth. What are called stichomythic lines. Here, let me show you this. Uh, stichomythia or stichomythic lines, lines of verse that fill out the blank verse line by, by using one piece of it rather than the whole. So uh, hark. When I descended, now, you know, the, 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 the little fragments of lines. This is a, it's a Greek term from Greek verse. But it, it, it is to show you again the fragmentation of their control over language and over thinking, that, the, that the, the, the language itself begins to break down, as we saw with Othello's fit, where he was a fit in prose in that case instead of in verse. Uh, and then it is covered over by this over, overly um, uh, Prettified language. There lay Duncan, his golden uh, silver skin laced with his golden blood, and so forth. That, that, that where Macbeth begins to speak in overly elegant language as he ga gains control and begins to kind of try to tell a story here. Uh, but the, the who discovers the body? Sorry, Macduff. Macduff. Yes, Macduff and Lennox come to the to the castle to wake the king in the morning. And uh, that there's a knocking on the gate that is, again, part of the mythology of this play. It's a very uh, uh, powerful, powerful signal, both from the real world and from the world beyond. And when Macduff discovers the body, uh, how does he describe it? What's, what's, what seems to have happened? Anybody remember? Yeah, more? It's kind of repetition of Lear's horror speech. It's, oh, horror, 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 tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. And then Macbeth says, what's the matter? He right. says, right. Um, so that there, there's, uh, there's, there's this kind of apocalyptic sense of the end of the world, that, that, that every, you know, the king is dead, the king has been murdered, uh, everything 
is upside down. And so all those, those energies that were in the outer world, in the, in the Heath world, in the witch world, upside down. Uh, fair is foul and foul is fair. That, that thematic, which, which appears, Macbeth and, and Banquo repeat those words as if they have heard them when they don't in the, in the, their second appearance. The, the witches use that as a refrain. So here also, the world has become upside down. It, it's topsy turvy. The fair has become foul and the foul has become fair. And, and the, the whole of Scotland here, the whole of the Scottish nobility enter into this world of nightmare this world in which everything is somehow the opposite of what it seems to be. Uh, and how do the sons of Duncan respond? Why? They're afraid for themselves. There's, and, and then, here there's, there's you know, danger in men's smiles mm -hmm. again. Remember that, that, that where the father thought you could tell from the face what the temperament of the person was. Here they see that you cannot trust smiles and you cannot trust people's expressions, and they not only flee, they split up. And this is quite crucial, too, that one goes to England and one goes to Ireland, that these are for them places of safety, uh, as contrasted with the Scotland, which is this place of tremendous danger and, uh, and of blood immediately. And, they, and, and uh, paradoxically, or maybe not so paradoxically, their fleeing, of course, like the fleeing of Fleance, puts upon them the suspicion of the deed, says the text, that they are blamed because they have fled. You know, who, who, who caused this, who suborned the grooms and so forth? Uh, maybe it's the sons. So this is a very clever way, again, of getting rid of the rivals to the throne because, of course, what's, what, what has Duncan done? Uh, I should have mentioned this before. What has Duncan done vis-a-vis -vis his older son that has made Macbeth feel that he has to act? Prince, the Prince of Cumberland, the Prince of Cumberland, who is the, the, the official next in, in, in line to the throne. Your footnotes will tell you again the Scottish throne is not uh, automatically, generationally, from, from, oldest, from, from the king to his son and so forth, that there needs to be a choice here. In this case, the choice is made by the king himself, that he invests the, the Malcolm with this title of the Prince of Cumberland, and this precipitates the action on the part of Macbeth. Yes? I'm wondering, um, why doesn't Macbeth become known as King Macbeth in this play? Other plays that we've seen, when when the prince or the or the uh, successor to the throne uh, changes into a king, becomes uh -huh. a king, uh -huh. his name changes in the in, in the speech in the, prefixes. In the you mean? Right. That's a very good question. Um, I absolutely don't know the answer to that. Um, I have no idea why that is. Um, and it's a very good question, because it's often, in fact, and uh, some recent very good textual scholars have tried to look at the point in some other history plays when the speech prefix does change from rich to K rich or something. But we never do get K Macbeth here. That's, that's extremely interesting. Uh, one could you know, thematize some answer like he's never really the king or something, but in fact, he is the king. Uh, so, so I, I don't know the answer, and I, th I think it's it's not only legitimate but a fascinating question. I'll try to find out something about it. Yes, no, please. Uh, yeah. Who was in charge of those? Would that have been the typesetter, or would the playwright would have been expected to have some um, control over what those are? As as you know, it, it, we don't know the end. It's not the playwright. It's usually not the playwright. It's 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 often in respect of the performance itself. Um, it's not, this is not, so, some of the plays don't even have speech prefixes. Sometimes the speech prefixes are put in by editors. Um, but let's see what this one says. Hold on a second. I won't take much of your time. Um, I'm not going to be able to find it out in, in time to use up our time. I'll, I, will, I will look it up and get back to you. Yes. So uh, the, the fact that Macbeth isn't referred to as king once he is didn't bother me so because maybe Duncan they're, wasn't because either. they're in Scotland and it's not England. And, and, it's just, and, it's right, just right, 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 right. In the, in the Norton, it, it's the first, the first 
person in the play is King Duncan, Duncan of Scotland, and when he talks, he's referred to as King Duncan. Okay. Um, I'm King Duncan, but he's, the character name is listed. In, I should say that in the sources, in Hollinshed's Chronicles, he's described as Macbeth. And, uh, and uh, never, I mean, here you've got a little bit of it at the beginning of, the, of your text here. Uh, Macbeth, Macbeth's queen, um, he's not described as, as King Macbeth. Though it also should be said that, a, that, that the Shakespearean history, the, the history we get in Shakespeare's play here, is, does not accord with the history that we get in the Chronicle sources. That in the Chronicle sources, Macbeth reigned for about 10 years and was thought of as a very good king. That the idea that Duncan is uh, what was a virtuous king who was slain immediately by a usurper who was a less good king is not the story that the sources tell. Duncan is actually a rather weak king. Macbeth was a very successful king for a long time. Uh, it's not, I mean, here we get this notion that he uh, usurps, uh, turns bad, is immediately you know, replaced by the, the, the return to virtue. But that's, that, that's, that's his playtime. This is not, not reflected in the Chronicles at all, which just goes to show you, again, that Shakespeare knows how to tell a good story, that this is not, this, that this is not, a, uh, this is not the versified version of a Chronicle. This is taking this, these elements as materials and making of them a, a, a piece of drama that is only secondarily about the history of Scotland, that it's really about a whole set of other things. I, I, I'd like for us to talk for a second uh, about the, uh, the Banquo scene before we come to uh, the, the sleepwalking scene. I want to see if we can stay within the chronology of the play a little bit. Uh, by the time, um, the, the, first of all, why does uh, Macbeth um, want Banquo dead? We've already a little bit touched on this. Sorry? Because, yes, because, because, because of, of the, the flans issue. But notice that at this point, he is trying somehow to outsmart the prediction. Prediction says, you should be king, you, your sons will be kings. So he believes one part of the prediction, but he's trying to control this, the prediction by, it's like the, the appointment in Samara story. You know, he's trying to do something that will uh, deny one part of the prediction even as the other part of the prediction comes true. And so he, he, he gets the murderers together and he sends them off uh, to, uh, to kill Banquo and Flans, uh, and half of this and only half of this gets done, uh, which leads to the feast scene in which the ghost of Banquo appears. So what I'm interested in here, among other things, are these various apparitions that appear in the play and the way in which they seem, if they do, to escalate so, and to change character. Uh, what, what various things are seen by Macbeth? The dagger, yes, which we don't see, except in very literalist productions. Is this a dagger that I see before me? How about the, that? Then we get to the ghost of Banquo, uh, which do we see? Do we, do we don't see it? You think we don't see it? Yeah, it's, uh, we, uh, usually we do see the ghost of Banquo, uh, so that, that uh, the, the, you'll, you'll see in, in various stagings of this that the, 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 there's a chair or a stool. Uh, it seems to be empty. The ghost of Banquo quietly arrives and sits down and smiles at him. And the, everyone sitting around the table doesn't see this except Macbeth himself. And uh, so, so here we are more within the consciousness of Macbeth, that this, this, this vision that he sees is also shared by us. But it also gives you that epistemological question about sort of, is it real or is it not? What is the status of a ghost of the ghost of Banquo in this period? Does the ghost of Banquo speak? No, no, OK. Um, so. Uh, these are the things that Macbeth sees, and he also sees, of course, the weird sisters and their apparitions. Uh, uh, and this, this, this scene in which Lady Macbeth, crucially, does not see the ghost of Banquo, but Macbeth does see the ghost of Banquo, is, it leads to this conversation about unmanning 
and about, you know, the, the uh, show me something real like a Hyrcanian tiger and I, you know, will run toward it rather than away from it. Uh, the, if I run away from it, protest me the baby of a girl. But this kind of thing I can't bear. Uh, the, the, there's a split between his consciousness and her consciousness that develops here, or that begins to develop here. Uh, so how do we get from Macbeth sees the ghost of Banquo to the sleepwalking scene where it's Lady Macbeth who begins to see things? What happens between them that gets us from the one place to the other? Yeah, or what happens in the play? She says um, at one point in the scene, why do you keep alone, she yeah. says to yes. him. So there seems to be, he seems to be going more and more within himself and less dependent on her for motivation. The one of the reasons that he says, I'm going to be alone for a while, is to sort of sense the murderers. It's true. He's alone, but he's also, he, he's, he's beginning to do more things uh, in order to try to, shore up his, his, the, the, what he thinks he's, he's earned here. But yes, there, that there is, there, there, that, that, that twinnedness that we saw with them is no longer functioning. What else? Yes. Sorry. Um, Macduff and his family are murdered. Not Macduff, his family, his wife and kids are murdered, which she seems to talk about in her sleepwalking scenes. That's uh, the the yes the exactly thane. the thane of Fife had a wife exactly the the uh, so that the, this escalating uh, expanding uh, and none of these actions of course none of them zero of them are explicitly motivated by the weird sisters on the heat they don't say go do this they don't say you can be king if you murder Macduff you can be king if you murder Duncan uh, they don't say any of these things they 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 simply predict some future. And then, then uh, the, but the, so the thing of Fife had a wife is part of, I mean, the, again, the, I'm sure I described this in my chapter, but the, what, what's wonderful among other things about this sleepwalking scene is that, again, when we talk about repetition, the audience gets to re-experience the horror in case you've forgotten how horrible this was. And remember that we weren't present at the murder of Duncan. It's told to us. It's, it's we're outside that chamber. Uh, but the audience gets to re-experience this again in a kind of play within a play scenario in which there are on stage innocent watchers, the doctor and the waiting gentlewoman, who are watching uh, Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking and taking notes. This is a kind of medicalization. They're taking notes and trying to figure out what's wrong with her. And slowly these clues begin to, uh, uh, to unravel themselves, and they are completely horrified. And so their onstage presence, it's like Edgar in, in uh, King Lear, uh, when he says, oh, this, I wouldn't take this from report, it is, and my heart breaks at it. Their onstage horror reanimates the horror for us. And, and what, are, what, are the kind, what are the apparitions that appear to her, so to speak? What does she see in her mind's eye? Blood. Blood, yes. The, 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 and where does this blood on your hands business come from? Is it, I mean, it appears in her dream. Where else does it appear in the play? I'm sorry? Ah, oh, that's certainly true. Yes, that the, 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 the little water clears me of, of, this, of this deed. That's what, what uh, Lady Macbeth says. But the idea that, that you can, that the blood of the innocent can merely be washed off your hand, that the hand washing of Pilate uh, is certainly present in the backstory here. What else? Where within the play itself, who talks about bloody hands? Macbeth. Macbeth. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 this my hand will all the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. That, 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 that not, not only can I not wash my hand, this blood is going to infiltrate all the waters of the earth, making the green sea red. Everything from this deed, the whole world is going to become infected with this act. Uh, and where else? Sorry. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. That, that the badging the face and the hands of the murderers of Duncan. Um, and at, at the, the hand begins, as, as, as we, we say, to, to detach itself from any body. So you have uh, the, 
the come ceiling night, scarf up the murderous hand of day, and so forth. That the the uh, so that by the time you get to the to the the sleepwalking scene, you have all of these images of blood, of bloody hands, of of the the impossibility of washing, of the backstory of 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 another kind of death of the innocent, and so forth. And all she's doing is trying to wash her hands. All she's doing is this repetitive motion. Again, a very nice thing about this production at the uh, Actors Shakespeare project uh, is that the sleepwalking scene seems to begin all over again. Does anybody remember this? For those of you who've seen it, if you go and see it, uh, she the, the she begins again at the end of the sleepwalking scene, so that you get very much this sense that this is a recurrent dream again. That you're in this repetition that it's not one dream that they happen to see, but as they report, this happens all the time. And that she, too, is stuck in this repetition of, but, but why should it be that her interiority is now visible to us? Why should it be that we, that this, the, the, the bring forth men, children only, the completely uh, unpenetrated uh, Lady Macbeth, this unsexed, powerful Lady Macbeth, now turns into a woman with a nightmare in a nightgown. Yes? It, when she does show this infirmity, it's when she's not conscious. She's actually in another state. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not as she is when she can stand up and speak for herself. She's in another place. I think that's extremely important. And in fact, we never see her regain her senses, so to speak. She goes off stage. She dies off stage. He says she should have died hereafter. Uh, the suggestion is made that perhaps she's done away with herself and so forth, that, that, that we, she is in another state, an altered state, we could say. But her, her, this other state of hers is somehow analogous as well as not analogous to that empowered other state of the witches. The witches are a different kind of nightmare, kind of cultural nightmare, as opposed to a, a, an internal psychological nightmare. But these are all alternative stages, states to, to the waking world, the world of conscious action. Please. Uh, saw something else interesting in, in the way that, uh, the, the way Macbeth was influenced. Uh, the witches were giving him clues and although there's a line in here where they talk about the the uh, the, the ship at the beginning, they say about the the, the pilot or the the, the sailor uh, right. whose wife wouldn't give her the chestnuts. Yep. They said they can't. Basically, she said we can't sink the ship, but we can shake it up. But Lady Macbeth actually has the power because she is in in the real world at this time to make things happen. So I think that she exercises that power. But the, when she's, again, the, the line you point to is an important one. Though the ship cannot be lost, yet it can be tempest-tossed. But the idea that, that there's a limit to their power. But within that power, there's, there, within those limits, there's a tremendous amount of power. And here Lady Macbeth is precisely in that tempest-tossed situation, that, again, inside-outside situation. And, and the fact that she was so powerful, that she was so... That, we, that we, if you take her from the letter-reading scene which is also a kind of offstage, onstage moment, to the sleepwalking scene, which is an offstage, onstage moment. One about hyper-consciousness. I read this text, and I'm interpreting it. Uh, and the other, this internal associative script that she that, that, that is her, her, her dream here. Uh, uh, again, the, 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 the idea that that dream might subtend the whole play, that it might become the whole play, becomes extremely powerful. And Macbeth, by contrast, begins, and, and you know, this is manifest in the play, to lose feeling, that where he had so much feeling, now he has supped full of horrors. Remember that, that you know, the, we've gone from the banquet to the supping full of horrors, that, 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 that the time was that, that his senses would cool to hear a night shriek. This is the response to that question about his hair being unfixed at the beginning, that at the end, he, he is impervious to any, and, and the shriek, of course, is the shriek of the women uh, about the death of Lady Macbeth. It is offstage. The, the cry of women, what's that noise? The cry of women. Now, the cry, again, the play is all about the cry of women from the beginning to the end. Yes. She unsexes herself. Please. Um, that she, um, in a sense, castrates herself, which, of course, she can't physiologically do, but she makes herself 
um, from powerful to powerless, and it's in that state that she um, ends her life. Well, I think first thing that the first unsex me here is actually a gesture toward power, as, as we said earlier, and that yes, right, 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 and also she doesn't have children. But there was some illusion that she had a child, but we don't know what happened to the. Yeah, well, this, this is again much is made of this. Of the uh, uh, is there is she childless? How many children had Lady? Famous uh, uh, title of my article: How many children had Lady Macbeth? Where the author of the article thought that this was actually a foolish question to ask, though in fact critics from that time to this have sort of asked. This question: uh, Children died very frequently in this period. Children were fostered out; they were lost. There's no inconsistency. This isn't, you know, Shakespeare makes a mistake exactly. Uh, for all we know, she was married to somebody else before him. This is how I'd like to see this: that, that, that you know, he's younger than she; that she, you know, she's had a lot of worldly experience. Now she has this this young hero. Who knows what's going on here? But but the, the, what we know is that the, that he has no children. Doesn't ever say she has no children, actually. Now that I think about it, uh, but the the, uh, the there's a sense in which her connection with the world becomes more and more and more attenuated, and uh, that that finally she is in this period, of this this situation of her subconscious or her unconscious performing itself on the stage, and and then she dies, and he says she should have died hereafter. Uh, and then he is alone. And when he is alone, we have, uh, he has nothing left to lose, basically. That's, that's why he can say, uh, I, at least I'll die with harness on my back. That there's, there's, uh, but between that time and this, of course, comes the unmasking of the apparitions, comes the news that the apparitions that he thought were revealed to him to be security blankets, you know, they, no such thing as a man, not a woman born, and so forth, turn out all to be the, uh, the, the juggling fiends who palter with me in a double sense. Turns out to be that, that, that he's mis misinterpreted all these. Uh, expe and, and again, it unravels itself, that you get Macduff saying Macduff was from his mother's womb, untimely ripped, reminding us again of the childbirth scenario, and maybe of that early moment. Um, and then you, you hear the news about the moving grove. Now, again, in this time period as today, you know, you see still uh, modern films in which uh, guys in camouflage also have twigs in their helmets or something. This is not a, an unusual battlefield activity to hide yourself behind or as uh, pieces of landscape. So it should not come as such an enormous surprise. Uh, it's a failure of interpretation here. And I don't think that we need to imagine, you know, all the trees. I mean, often the pr production really shows you the trees marching along here. But you could perfectly well do it in a way that would make more sense in terms of warfare, that you would see the illusion of a moving grove. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's something, uh, weirdly, I was going to say, listen to me, there's something extremely for him liberating or freeing about getting out from under those apparitions. There's a moment in which he rebounds as a hero at the end, when he goes into the, the, the battle, when he repeats, so to speak, that moment that the other Thane of Cawdor, you know, nothing in his life uh, uh, became him like the leaving of it. That's the moment when he repents, actually. In this case, Macbeth goes back into the battle, and then the next thing we see is, behold, where comes the usurper's cursed head. So we have got, again, the... The enemy, the, and, and again, this is this is cultural practice in this period. If you were to go through the gates of London, you would see the heads of traitors on pikes. That this is this is not an, uh, a, a fantasy. This is actually something you could also see in the cultural theater, that is to say, the public world of Shakespeare's time. Uh, but the play doesn't end only with the death of Macbeth. It ends instead with the reconstitution of the state. On the on the part of of um, Malcolm, and this is that moment that we saw at the end of King Lear, the moment that we see at the end of every one of these plays in which somebody tries to pull everything back together again. And as we said with Edgar or Albany, depending upon who you think speaks those last lines at the end of King Lear, this is a diminished figure, a figure neither as great as Duncan nor as great as Macbeth, uh, who is the survivor here. And let's just look, if we can, at what happens at the very and um, we shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves. So already we've, we, we've got the royal we back, 
but we've also importantly got a different notion of we-ness, if you like, that where the we-ness of the, of the middle of the play was Macbeth plus Lady Macbeth, um, here we have um, my thanes and kinsmen henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. Uh, what's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, is almost always this thematic of, of, of the agricultural rebound here. Um, the, uh, this and what needful else that calls upon us will perform in measure, time, and place. In other words, after the play, these things will happen. One second, and we'll be out of here. Um, the, just one second, sorry. Uh, okay, all right. Um, the rest is silence, as they say at the end of Hamlet. Okay, uh, I'll see you next week uh, for Etnia Cleopatra.